All right, I think we're ready to go here. My name's Dr. Mark Miller. Of course, you you should be in is advanced manufacturing processes. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started with our first session, and we'll have a quiz after each session. Now, you don't have to take the quiz immediately. I want you to study, go over the material, because each quiz is time for only five minutes. And if it's 5, 10, 15, 20 questions, you only have so much time. So you can't just look up all the answers fast enough in your notes because they kind of pick it and expect you to put two and two together and stuff like that. So it's kind of difficult. <clears throat> Not real difficult. All I'm saying is if you go over the notes, study them, then take a quiz, you're going to pass. You're going to do well. If you don't, well, then you're in trouble. Don't just think. Hey, I w went through the slides real quick. I'll take the quiz and then, oh, geez, I got this wrong. Well, if it's only a five-question quiz, you get one wrong, it's an 80. You know, you want to get an A in the class, that's not the way to go. So, at any rate, there's only five minutes that you have, so you need to study the material. And then when you have a midterm and a final, I may only have it 30 minutes or an hour. I think I'll have it 30 minutes because you can just look up everything. And if I give you an hour or two hours to take the exam, because nobody's watching you. So it's going to be a time test. You better know it ahead of time or you'll be in trouble. Now, is this class hard? Well, if you watch all these sessions, take all the quizzes, study like I tell you to do, no, I think you'll do well. But if you try to jam it all in at the last minute, forget it. What we're going to try to do is, I sometimes teach this as a night class, and it's usually three hours of material a week. So you'll see two or three sessions a week. Every time I do a session and make a quiz available, I will email you. So make sure you have it to where your Gmail or whatever your regular email account is. It's connected with our Patriots mail, and IT support can do that for you. You know, I-T-S-U-P-P-O-R-T at uttyler.edu, just use that, IT support at uttyler.edu. And uh, they'll either mail you the link of how to do it and connect them. And if you still can't do it, just ask them and they'll do it for you. Uh, and it should be on the web page somewhere as well. Um, that way, every time I send an email through, the, the only thing Blackboard lets us use is the Patriots email you'll get it to your regular email account. Again, this is an internet class, online class, I should say. And we only have five weeks, so you gotta have at it and, and keep. Now I expect every week, once we cover everything, that you're done by 6 p.m. at night. That gives me time to look over things, what I have to do, and see if everybody's doing well. So what I'm saying is, let's say we have three lectures and three quizzes throughout the week. You've got till Sunday at 6 p.m. I mean, if you need it later at 8, just let me know. But I, I need some time to look at and see how everybody's doing and make sure there aren't any problems. And that way, um, <clears throat> you'll have time because you say, well, it's an online class. I shouldn't have to, you know, I got to work, you know, 8 to 5 or whatever. Well, that's the deal. You have flexibility. It's not going to be, I'm posting this stuff and then I expect you to read it the exact time. No, no, no. You've got till Sunday. Now don't procrastinate, obviously. Um, the other thing is the final though, we I will only open it up the last day of class, which is that Friday. And that's all you get. Friday eight to five or something. Now if I see that's gonna be an issue I may do it the day before if we cover everything on time. But if not, expect the final will just be a one-day thing. Maybe 8 till midnight for some of you that have to work during the day or something like that. That would make it fair enough to you. All right, any questions? Oh, no, I can't hear you. Well, that's the idea. If you do have questions after you've gone through all the integrity sessions that I give you and it's still something isn't clear, then send me an email. But again, I've got about 60 students between the classes this session. And um, I can't answer everybody's email if everybody's going to just say, hi, how's it going? Hey, I have problems with this. And again, any computer issues, anything like that, make sure you contact ICT to support because I don't know. 
if it's going to work for a Mac, if it's going to work for this type of computer, that computer. I don't know, and I don't want to know. That's their job. They enjoy doing that. That's what they're trained to do. And I can keep mine running. I can keep the computer lab running well enough. But that's about all I know, and that's all I want to know. <clears throat> so, again, if you have problems, contact IC IT support. They'll be more than happy to help you. That is their job. You pay a course fee for it. So they will help you. And then if it's an actual computer issue, if you bring your computer in, they'll work on it right there for you. If you're a student, you do have that type of access and that type of capability where they will, that's type of support, I should say, where they will help you. All right, well, we'll keep moving here. Um, first section of the class is welding. Then we get into advanced machining processes and other things. So let's go ahead and cover welding and fabrication and all that. But if you look at this, the production of a desired shape. Well, let me make it bigger here. <clears throat> here we go. Production of a desired shape is a major part of the manufacturing processes. There are four alternatives. So there's different ways to put things together. All right. So you can either consolidate smaller pieces by welding them together, which is quick and easy if you've welded. I mean, once you get it all set up. Or you can drill holes and pop rivet it if it's small or have to put bolts, nuts and bolts in it or uh, sheet metal screws depending on the thickness, you know, which is a little more time consuming. But if you have to take it apart later, then probably you'd want to use fasteners. Or you can machine something where you just take, let's say if you were going to make, uh, you know, like I see some of these racing motors where they're made out of aluminum at some of these places. And they just take one big block of aluminum. They don't even cast it. And then they just hog it all out and machine it all from that one big block of aluminum. So you could machine something. Obviously, you could waste a lot of material that way. You, you may need a combination of these, but anyhow. Casting, where you just have a mold of something, pour the molten metal in, and do it that way. And then the deformation process is where if you had a flat piece of sheet metal, you stamp it and you get a fender or something like that instead of having to cast a fender or whatever. It just depends on what your application is. Obviously, some are better than others for what you're doing. So you say, why weld? Uh, and what kills me is if you look at welding, um, you look around the turn of uh, the 20th century, so about 1900, late 1800s is when they kind of invented the welding process. And before, if you look at those old uh, boats, I should say ships, the first like battleships, dreadnoughts and all that, and even the Arizona and those type class, they were all, uh, they drilled holes and they riveted them together. They weren't welded. It wasn't until World War I, towards the end of it, where they learned to weld things together. But if you look at all those old tanks and that, uh, there are, you see these big lumps on them. They, they drilled holes and they riveted them together. So they put this on one side and this comes out straight and then they hammer it till they mushroom the other side. And that's what holds it together. Well, I mean, think about that. That's time consuming. It'd be much easier just make a pass and weld it and all that. Well, they learn to get flux, different materials in the flux, of the, and add that to a welding rod, which took all the impurities, brought it to the top, and then you can chip it off a slag or depending if it's a big process, you don't have to, but you have shielding gases around it. Uh, they didn't have that before. They didn't understand that. So they tried to weld and it would get too cool quickly and it would cause cracks. And it wasn't as strong as just riveting it and putting two extra plates here, you know. So that's why they didn't weld. But <clears throat> Anyhow, again, reasons for welding. Assembly's quicker. You can restore the outside diameter of something. Let's say, uh, for instance, one of these buckets for a track hoe or front end loader or something. It gets worn out of you know, from digging and, and going through rock. And, of course, that's going to abrade it and wear it down. Then you can just weld some beads, as you see over here, and build it back up again. Because, you know, obviously these things are expensive. So it would be much cheaper just to weld some more beads. And usually that's what they do, too, uh, as a uh, wear resistance is. This... You say, well, why not just make it out of a harder material so the rocks don't chip it away? Well, if you make something too hard, what happens? 
becomes too brittle and it breaks. It's like glass. Glass, if you look at it, it's pretty durable. Uh, you know, from scratching and all that stuff compared to, let's say, plastic, which is a little more flexible, like uh, acrylic, you know, clear acrylic. It scratches very easily. That's why we still have most of our stuff is made out of glass for windows and that. For one, it doesn't crack later on you from the sun and all that, the UV. And two, it doesn't scratch as easily when you clean it and all that because it's not as hard, but that's good and bad. Now, so what you do is you can make this out of a more mild steel where it's not as strong, it's not had been tempered as much, and then you put a coating of the, the welding rod or whatever you're using, the welding wire, that's harder. And so you're hard surfacing something. And that way it's got that hard coating on it you know, these welding beads that this guy's welding on there. But then it's still kind of a little milder, pliable, where if it hits something, it'll kind of bend and instead of just crack and break. Um, and that way it lasts that much longer. So that's why they do that. Uh, and then for repair, quick repair, you're out in the middle of nowhere, you're out in a farm, and you live in Montana, and if they ship something in from Chicago or whatever, it take them a week or something, and here you can just fix it real quick. And you don't have to throw away the part. You're doing your part for recycling. Plus, it's expensive, you know, especially farm machinery and that. you got to be able to fix it quickly in the field because you only may have a day or two to harvest, and you waste two or three days, and you've lost your entire crop, and that's your whole salary for the year. All right, so anyhow, definition of welding. Localized coalescence of metals or non-metals by either heating of materials to a suitable temperature with or without the application of pressure. And you'll see some like for spot welding that way of pressure. Or by the application of pressure alone and with or without the use of filler metal. So an extra, you know, welding wire or, or you know, like stick for stick welding, the, the actual welding rod. Coalescence, if you look at this, the growing together of the grain structure. So coalescence. Uh, we're looking at this uh, when two, usually if you're doing actual welding versus brazing, and we'll talk about soldering, those are different materials. That's almost, if you think about it, it's almost like an adhesive because it's a different material. When you're actually welding, you're using the, the, the stick or the wire that you're using is the same material that you're welding on. So when it all fuses together, the grains grow together and you're in good shape. That's it should be, the weld should be strong or stronger than the original material. <clears throat> then you know you've done it right. So, three classes of welding. We have fusion. So heat is used to melt the base metals uh, or base and filler metals. The metals mix as they solidify and grow into one. So again, fusion welding, the actual base metals and the filler metal rods, it's all the same. So all the grain structure. So obviously this is the strongest. All right. Then we have brazing and soldering. Now, you know how you're sweating or, or soldering pipes together, copper pipes and that. It, it's almost like a, if you were doing PVC, you know how you have that glue and you're able just to solvent cement and that solvent eats through it just like uh, plastic model cement for polystyrene type models and that, which most are, you know, car models, tank models, whatever plastic models are, you glue them together. It kind of actually dissolves that. That's why, like, if you're making one of those car models and you had a little glue on your fingers and you touch it, you'll notice that nice shiny surface, or if, let's say it's the clear windshield, it actually dissolves it and ruins it. And because it's actually dissolving a little and the other's dissolving when you put the glue on and when you press them together, it actually makes a bond. <clears throat> um, let's see what else here. So soldering, though, is a filler metal. You know, it's, it's not lead anymore, but it's tin and some other um, antimony and some other things. And what it does is it gets hot enough through capillary action. You'll see once you get the pipes hot enough, you put that little solder in there. It sucks it right in and seals it up. And it fills in any cracks, holes, or what have you, so that way the water won't leak in that. But it's a different material than your base metal. It's not copper. Just like brazing, you know, it looks like it's that shiny brass stuff. But it's a different material. 
than what you're doing. And what it does is you're able to fuse these things together at a lower temperature than, you know, let's say five or 6,000 degrees, let's say if you're melting uh, steel or something like that. So um, <clears throat> this way you can just use a little propane torch or whatever. And it's much easier, safer, and all that. You don't need all this heavy-duty equipment. And especially with your uh, non-ferrous materials, you know, that aren't steel, they have a lower melting temperature, so it works out well. All right, then we have the solid state. You've probably seen these little spot welders, how they spot weld your car together. And yeah, we actually have one like that. Uh, coalescence is produced at temperatures below the melting point of the base metal, no filler metal. But then it's pressured. It heats it up just below its melting, and then when it presses down, it's enough to be able to fuse those two together. And for those of you who've used a spot welder in one of our classes and that, or at home or, or somewhere, you'll notice it works. Usually if you try to pull the two pieces together, the metal will rip somewhere else besides the weld. So it's a quick, easy way to put something together for thin materials. You can't go really thick with it. Different types of weld. Well, the two basic welds are they're either butted together. Okay, these two pieces are just butted together just like your, well, I shouldn't say that, but your butt cheeks, you know, and it forms a crack there, but they're butted together. Okay, now this, they've, they've cut a groove so they can weld multiple beads to uh, get thicker pieces together. Now, if it's a thinner piece, you don't have to bevel this and put a groove in it, usually one. Or if you're using a, a different type of welding process, a more expensive type that does a narrow or a uh, plasma and some of these other ones we'll get into, electron beam, uh, you can leave them butted together with pretty thick materials and it fuses and gets in there well. But these other ones, you don't get enough deep enough penetration. If you had a big, you know, one or two inch thick piece, nah, you couldn't get in there with just one single pass of a weld. Uh, so you have to bevel it. So you either have it flat where they're butted together, you're trying to put them together, or at a 90 degree where it's an upside down T. And, and we'll get into T welds, lab welds, and different types of, you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. But the two main basic types of welds are it's either butted together or it's a fillet of some type, which means uh, it's at 45 degrees. So this is like a T weld where they're upside down T, but you're angling it at 45, just like when you're lapping them two together. Here's a lap weld, and then you have to, so you either have to connect them like that where you're holding at an angle, or you hold it just straight down. Now, obviously, we'll get into other stuff, but two basic welds, butt and fillet. Not a fish fillet, but when it's welding, it's a fillet. Right. Then you get into the five basic weld joints. All right, so these were the two basic welds. Then we get into the joints. Here's the bud where it's butted again. Uh, and then, and you'll notice with all these, they're either going to be, for the welds, they're either going to be a bud or a fillet. So we look, there's the bud again. There's our crack there. Then here is, uh, if you look at this one, uh, a corner joint. What do you think is going to go there? I'm going to fill it. And then here where you have an edge, well, that's just butted together, isn't it? So here, again, you have to do this at 45, so it'll be a fillet in this lap. And then with this T, it'll be a fillet as well. So you have your butt and fillet. And then you apply those two to the different types of joints. And then they use butt again, which makes everything confusing. But again, I didn't come up with this terminology. That's just the way it is. Then you have joint edge preparation. So depending on how thick it is and what you have to do, you may get away with, you know, I said you had to cut some grooves in it uh, to get better penetration. Now, you might not have to go all the way with that groove. You notice on where was it? This, this one, see how it's not all the way? Because you can first do a single pass at that thickness. And then you may have to do two passes, three passes, four passes, and keep piling them on top of each other like that. All right. And so same here. You may only need a single bevel to do it. Uh, then you may have to do it on this side and then come back and do it on the other side. That's if you have access to both sides of that metal to be able to weld it. 
Seeing that's what they have a double double bevel butt weld. <laughs> single bevel butt weld. Say those really fast. Alright, then we have a single V well. Okay. And we have a double V, again, if you can get access to both sides. And then a single J. Sometimes those work better. And then a double J, just depending on what you're doing, the different types of material. And we'll get into that. Or what you have available to cut these grooves out. So that's another thing that um, makes these. You, you wonder why do they come up with a J and a U versus a V and a this and that. All right, then the welding positions. We have flat. So we have six of them. Flat is the easiest. It's just flat and you weld down on it. Horizontal. Let's see. That. Yeah. So if you look at this horizontally. Um, you're going across, where is it? Yeah, horizontally like so. Try to look at my pictures. There's your flat. So that's the easiest to weld. Then here, you know, trying to keep it two pieces, you know, inside. Well, obviously that's a little more difficult because you got, you're not able just to drag your arm across the metal or whatever. Um, so a little more difficult there. And then you got to worry about it sagging. Okay. And here vertical, you're either having to work it up or work it down. And then you have to worry about sagging a lot more with that. So that's a little more difficult. Then we have an overhead. So, I mean, that whole thing could be falling on you. Much more difficult. And you haven't hold it in an awkward position. I know I've been installing ceiling fans. And, oh, God. You know, it's it's not fun. It's, yeah, obviously, if, if this could be bolted on later or something, it would be best to do it flat. And that's the deal with all of these. It's preferable if you can do them all in the flat, because you know it's easier to weld that way. You can get a better weld. You don't have to worry about gravity and all that other stuff. And then assemble this later. Okay, but if it's something that's in a fixed position, you have to weld it that way. That's the only time you go to these other processes, I mean these other positions. So obviously that's more difficult. Then you have a pipe. Where are you having to go around a pipe? Then you're having to go around a whole pipe and at an angle, 45 degrees. Is, so these progressively get more difficult. Because think about you having to try to keep that weld be the same, going all these different angles and around. So, as you can see. So I may ask on a quiz, you know, what's the number six welding position? You'll say, geez, I don't know. Well, no, you won't. If you study this, you'll know. And then you can see it progressively gets harder. So flat would be easy, you know, horizontal, vertical is more difficult. Uh, because you could be either going up or down. Gravity is really going to affect it here. It's only affecting it one way. Then overhead, much harder to do. Then pipe, trying to go around a curved surface. And then a pipe at a 45. So, you know, it makes sense. And then there's the different parts of your actual weld, your groove nomenclature. Yeah, how about that? So, here's the face, obviously, the parts you see, somebody's face. And then the extra reinforcement that you'll see, usually you'll see it sticking up, especially you'll add some filler metal. Sometimes you don't, it's maybe a recess. Then where the face meets the sides of the two pieces you're putting together here, where you actually see that. I mean, obviously it's right there, but where you can see it's overlapped. Those are called the toes, I guess. Well, the face is up here and the toes are further down. The roots weigh on the bottom, so pretend like this is your ground line. This is a tree or something. The root's going to be in the bottom. Well, that makes sense. And then how much penetration you have down there, too. And then you have your fusion zone. So how much did this actual, let's say, filler metal fuse and mix with your base metal? So that's pretty good. You know, it's gotten in there. It's, and you hate it when it just sits on top of it. Then, obviously, it's going to break off. It's terrible. All right keep moving here and then here we have one with a fillet weld where it's at 45 degrees and again your fusion zones and all then they also have yeah if you go across let's say from toe to toe these two corners across and in the middle um, if you look at that that's what they call the throat so we'll think about it, it's going down you down your throat they call that the throat so anyhow again I don't come up with this stuff but that's what it is um, and at the actual throat, uh, this is a theoretical throat, but they're saying if you if you made it well perfectly flat, but usually there's extra material, which is okay, don't get me wrong. And so your actual throat is to the top of that face and all the way down to the root. 
And here's another one. I used to have an overhead of this, as you can see. It's been written out a few times, but again, there's your well. There's the face, the toe on either side, your throat going, you know, right down the throat of your face here. Uh, your fusion zone, how much it's actually fusing into there. And then if you have your toes there, then the actual legs of the two pieces. Okay, they call that the leg. And then the root is down on the bottom. So I think I've gone over this a few times, so you should understand it. Um, then here's one with the groove that, you know, they ground it first. Again, there's your throat, reinforcement zones, uh, fusion. I should say reinforcement is how much more it comes out. But your fusion zones, how much it actually melted in with the base metal. That's your filler metal. The root, the root gap, you know, how much space did you have between. Because you usually, you don't just butt them together. You want it to actually fuse in there. So you're going to have to have a little bit of a crack. And usually you figure out what the crack is. And... Um, then you'll have to make um, some little small welds every so inches, tack welds I should say, to keep it together at a certain distance. You don't want to just start welding and just leave a gap because as you heat up or you move or the table moves, it's going to come out at an angle and then it's going to be too wide. So what you do is you line them up perfectly and go eh, and just get a little bit of a weld here. I'll lay a little bit. And then a little a couple inches down a little and so you tack weld a little bit, and that way it's all going to stay together as you're welding it. Uh, let's see what else we got here. The, the bevels, the side walls here. Yeah. And so what they're saying here, I, I missed the, the main gist of this one, is the actual groove angle is these two put together. So that is like this. Like if it was perfectly straight, if this was 45 and 45, it would be 90. It looks like this one's a little more than that. So it's your included, the interior angle of these two put together, the included angle. So 90, 110, 120, whatever it may be. All right, the base metal, the metal that's actually welded, you know, your two plates, whatever you're welding together. Uh, the depth of fusion or penetration, uh, distance that fusion extends into the base metal, you know, past that. Um, let's see what else we got here. Pass that brood and all that. Face, exposed surface on the weld, uh, on the side from which the welding was done. Again, I, I think you have to fill in slides, so that's the best bet. Instead of just listening to me, then it all just starts <sighs> blending together. You fall asleep, and then you don't do well in the quizzes, so. All right, uh, the root point at which the bottom of the weld intersects the base metal surface. The toe junction between the face of the weld and the base metal. And then the leg, I show you distance from the root of the joint to the toe and the filling, you know, kind of the thickness of that material. Again, there it is again. So your reinforcements is extra. So if you had this straight line, let's say connecting the two toes, all this extra part is reinforcement. So again, here they all are again. Again, the bevel angle, angle formed between the prepared edge of the metal and a plane perpendicular to that. So that's just the one side. Uh, and then you have your groove face, surface of the metal on the groove, and then the groove angle Total, that's when you put the two together, total included angle of the grooves from both parts of the weld, or to be welded. And then let's see the root face, uh, again, portion of the groove face adjacent to the root of the joint. And so that's that, you know, those little flat parts, and then there's the bottom of it. And then it angles. So how much, you know, and then the root opening, how much space do you have between the two did you leave, if any? Sometimes you don't have to. Okay, then we get into these extra terms. A stringer bead is welding mm, without any side-to-side -side movement. So a stringer, nice straight string, straight string of line. So that's easy to remember. 
weave beads. That's when you go a little bit. Now, if you're an alcoholic, you got the shakes. That works out nicely, and you get a perfect well. No, I'm not saying become an alcoholic to become a welder, but anyhow, this one guy, he used to shake a lot, and he was a perfect welder. So, anyhow, and that's to help fill big, wide surfaces, too, wide gaps that you may have. The crater's depression at the end of the well when you let up because it's obviously not hot enough to leave that little extra piece. And the tack well, again, to hold it, if you have it spaced a certain distance, you do a little bead here, a little bead maybe there every few inches to make sure it's going to stay together that certain distance when you weld it. Travel angle, the angle less than 90 degrees between the electrode center line. So you don't hold the electrode just straight. You have to angle it, and we'll get into all the different angles for what have you. Backhand welding, or you go forehand welding, where you're pushing. You know, just make, take different types of welding, work better ways on different types of materials and different thicknesses. So again, we'll get into all of that good stuff and show you pictures. I also have some welding videos I'll put on this Tegrity session so you can watch them and you can see the correct way to do it. They're not bad. I mean the guy's actually maybe maybe he's a little more exciting than me, maybe not. Anyhow, uh, but he shows you how to weld so that's good. You actually get to see welding action not just looking at me look at you and follow these slides. <clears throat> so again backhand you're kind of dragging it and forehand, you're kind of pushing. So it shows you the travel angle, which way you're going. Let's say this is a stick welder. Here's your welding rod. You're holding it at this type of angle, and that one you're holding at that angle, but you're going this direction. All right, then we'll have a quiz on this. Now, I didn't get into all the other things this first quiz I have, so we'll continue on. You know, I can give you five or six quizzes on this, but let me see how it goes. Okay, now we get into our different types of welding. Right. We have our stick welding, which is our shielded metal arc welding. So what is arc welding? Both edges of the metal are heated by an arc until, and if you look at this, say you're heating this up, until, right, they fuse together. But see how you have that depression because they're fusing together, filling in that gap? So you have to add some filler metal. So more molten metal and flux is added from the rod, which, there we go, fills the crater and covers the top of the weld. And then you have the slag where all the impurities go, and plus it helps shield it to give it more time to cool. And when metal cools gradually, it's just like annealing something. The molecules align better, are bigger, and it's not as brittle. If you quench something quickly, it makes it real brittle and it could cause cracks there, internal cracks. That's why when you get into, they have to check welds, you know, uh, for nuclear reactors and that. Yeah, this is all important. Well, even just doing some plates, you'll, you'll notice cracks or the thing curves up on you if you're not careful. So, uh, this process continues the entire length of the weld. You just keep moving on down. Okay, so we get into our SMAW. You'll see all these acronyms, small, paw, you know, you'll say, what is going on here? All right, but shielded metal arc welding, an electric arc welding process in which an arc is established between the flux-coated consumable rod electrode and the workpiece. So you'll be welding along, but as you're welding, you're losing that welding rod because it's going in, so you got to learn to keep going this distance and pushing the welding rod, keeping and maintaining, whether it's an eighth or a quarter of an inch, whatever you're doing, uh, keep pushing it into the well so there's that little bit of space, but then you're using up that welding rod. So it's the only problem with stick welding is they're cheap. You can get these things inexpensively. Uh, and you have all these different welding rods you can use for all different types of purposes. But the operator factory, uh, operator factor, I should say, the OF, is not as good because you can only go so far, you use up the rod, then you got to stop, flip up your visor there, your welding helmet, 
find another welding rod and finish the weld and so obviously we get into our MIG processes we have a a spool of wire and we can just press that until we use up the whole spool of wire just depends on what you're doing the gaseous shield is provided by vaporization of the flux coating on the welding rod if not you can just get pieces of steel produced by the arc now I've done that I've used a I was in a bind I did, everything was closed I couldn't get any welding rods and I used a coat hanger and the weld was horrible because you don't have all of those the flux coating in there that helps with the, making a gas surrounding you and then all the impurities float up to the top and since you don't have that the, the weld cooled too quick um, the impurities just stayed in and it was just an awful weld but it was enough to get me where I had to go so uh, but yeah it makes a difference having that flux coating all right, uh, if you look at this, the process schematic of shielded metal arc welding. The metal core, most electrodes are made of the same core, you know, the metal that you're actually welding on. A flux coating is used to prevent, dissolve, or remove any oxides. Arc length, the space between the, and, and there's more to the flux coating, like I was saying. Space between the electrode and the workpiece, depending on what you're doing. And then the travel speed, how fast can you drag it or push it? And you'll see because you get used to looking at what the weld puddle, the molten metal, should look like. And, and you can tell the bead will be too narrow or too wide if you've done it too slow. or And, and we'll get more into all that. <clears throat> but those are the terms for it. Purpose of the flux covering, provide a protective atmosphere, kind of like if you have a MIG welder, which we'll get into later, the metal under gas, where you have those shielding gases in those cylinders. Well, we don't have to worry about that's the good thing about stick welding is you don't have to have a big bottle of gas and all that so um, the flux has it in there provides arc stabilizers makes it easier to weld like I said boy, welding with a coat hanger is not easy removal of impurities and it all forms up to the top which provides this slag and what happens is you have a chipping hammer and you chip it off and then underneath you can see the beautiful weld and so all the impurities form that slag again, which can be chipped right off. So it traps the impurities, prevents oxidation, reduces cooling rates. So again, so it doesn't get too brittle. Reduces the spatter too, because you'll hear that when you're welding, it sounds like you're frying eggs. Increase deposition efficiency, so you can deposit more material. You can add al alloying elements to make it stronger you know, to the actual uh, welding rod. Control the bead shape to give you a nice pretty bead or it just depends on what you're doing. Add additional filler metal. You can have more iron powder in there. And it also helps strike the arc. Yeah, it's hard to strike an arc with a with just a coat hanger. Alright, so and this shows you all the different parts, what's going off, the shielding gas and this is all depositing and melting you know depending on how you have it set it's going to vaporize differently visual electro there's another color shot of that kind of there's the coating on the welding rod there's your weld pool and there's your weld metal and base metal so obviously you're going to have more metal when you're done if you've done it right and then you chip off the slag that has all the impurities and garbage on and you'll know as you barely tap and stuff, it starts coming off. And there's kind of a weld puddle. They're in living colors, and that beautiful land makes my day. All right, anyhow, here's one of those Cracker Bach Lincoln type. They make, I think, one of the better stick welders. I mean, there's Miller, there's Hobart, there's all kinds. But uh, when it comes to their stick welders, pretty good. Lincoln has that nice little shape that you've seen. You just turn the dial depending on how much uh, you want uh, current and then you're ready to weld thicker materials or whatever easy simple so you got your power supply protective helmets uh, the various electrodes here and we'll get into electrode designation the electrode holder that you put it in and get it to different angles too and then you actually clamp it uh, because what well, you have a positive to a negative so you have to clamp your metal and that way it makes a complete circuit <clears throat> grounding clamp 
All right, remember that the, so we can move on with this. The constant current machines are the ones that are like stick welders. Then they got into the constant voltage, which is your flux core, the MIG welders, sub arc, and some others. Well, most of the other ones are, are constant voltage. But when it comes to constant current, because you're going to see this on a quiz, you have our regular shielded metal arc welding, the stick welding, and you have the um, TIG welder, tungsten inert gas, okay, TIG welder. And I think, yeah, which would be G-T-A-W, gas tungsten inert uh, arc welding, gas tungsten arc welding. Um, because I may give you this quiz before I finish all these notes. Um, <clears throat> I hate to do too much because you're going to fall asleep. Uh, constant current machine for stick welding and again for GTAW, gas tungsten arc welding. Uh, and you'll, we'll, we'll get into that, but the GTAWs also can be used as stick welders as well. So, uh, And I kind of like the TIG welding, the, the, the GTAW, the TIG welding. Uh, because it's so bright. Because you'll notice when you're welding, you'll say, I can't tell if this molten pool is right or not. It's so dark with these lenses. With TIG welding, it's so bright. It's like someone turned on the lights. And it's difficult to do, but I found it's easier because it's so bright, you can see what you're doing. I mean, it's like someone just turned on the lights. I find that the easiest way to weld. I mean, there's, you gotta hold the stick right, but you can see everything. So it makes it so much easier. Now MIG, you just push the, you know, the gun there. It's a little easier for most people. But I just kind of like TIG because you can see everything that you're doing. Terminal voltage decreases as the welding current increases. So you see that. So if one's increasing, the other one's decreasing with the constant current. This was the first type manufactured. Resistance changes as the arc length changes, so that's why you have to keep a, maintain a certain arc gap or you're going to have your weld kind of looks funny. Open circuit voltage is the voltage generated by the welding machine when no welding is done. So it's going to be higher. When you start welding, you'll see that this goes down. <clears throat> see, when you're welding, you went from 50 to 100, depending on the machine and what have you, to uh, 18 to 36. All right, because, you know, it's putting a load on it. Polarity, AC versus DC. There is no arc blow with AC. However, deeper penetration with DC. So you say, whoa, 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 what is all this? Alternating current, direct current. You know, like your battery in your car is direct current. DC battery, all these batteries you have that you fill in, all these little uh, electronic devices that you have. <laughs> And then alternating currents like the 110, 220 in your house and all that. <clears throat> Obviously. Now, um, why you may have one versus the other, maybe you have a generator and you're out on a work site. And so you go with the DC type. Now, AC is easier, uh, I think, because you don't have a generator. You don't have to clean all the brushes and stuff. There's less maintenance to do with an AC machine. But with a DC, you can get deeper penetration, depending if you have it on straight polarity or reverse polarity. It gives you a little more flexibility. AC is kind of in the middle. It gives you so much depth and penetration, I should say. And But there's no arc blow because of the current arcs back. In. DC, you'll see your arc, all of a sudden you're... You're welding and the darn arc's moving on you, going this direction, angling, and you have to come back and try to move it back over this way by moving your electrode farther. So you got to kind of play with it. Uh, that's the drawback with it. <clears throat> and then with AC, it can be attached, obviously, either way. Because they all the currents alternate. DC straight polarity, which I told you, depending on how you reverse your leads, the electrode is negative, allowing for higher depositions rates, but it'll deposit more material, but you have less penetration. DC reverse polarity, and you'll see these settings on your machine. The electrode is positive, which accounts for lower deposition rates, but better penetration. 
So 75% of the welding heat is given off on the positive side. So if we look at, um, where is it here? Yeah, DC reverse polarity, the electrode is positive. Um, so it's much hotter, that electrode. And uh, because of this, it's pinpointing that, that heat, you know, like the point of this tip. So if you look at it, it's not going to have as much. It's not, it's not heating up a wide area. It's pinpointed to the tip of your electrode. And so, which means it's hotter and it's going deeper. So it gives you deeper penetration. What's the other way around? If the, if it's the positive side, that means let's say you've clamped it to where it's straight polarity and your base metal is the positive, then all that heat is being distributed through the base metal. So when the, the, the actual welding rod comes, the heat, uh, is going to be, uh, hotter throughout so it's going to dissipate and make a wider welding uh, bead and deposit more material <clears throat> on you. All right so anyhow I, you know this is just stuff you need to know. I don't make it up that's just the way it is. All right so procedures using constant current power if you look at it stick welding the TIG I talked about and uh, plasmark welder we'll get into later, stud welders for just welding studs, uh, resistance welding, which is the spot welders we talked about. You know, you've seen those robots welding cars together. And air carbon arc for actually removing material, and with it you can cut grooves out. So when you're trying to make those grooves, you use this air carbon arc thing. And you can use it as a cutter and it blasts that stuff out and makes the grooves in the metal for you in the big thick plate so then you can weld them up with multiple passes. <clears throat> Power supplies, AC is a transformer, step down transformer obviously I forget what you get a couple thousand something coming through your your big high tension lines and then it, it steps it down into your neighborhood and then you step it down from your box to 110 in your house and so on and so forth. So step down transform. DC, a motor generator or transformer rectifier. And that's how you get your, your DC power. Cost about the same, however, AC is more uh, is, is much cheaper to maintain because DC has these brushes and commutators that you have to clean or, or replace. And so but again, DC allows you to be mobile on a truck somewhere out in the middle of the field and be able to weld something together. So it just depends on what you're doing. Versatility, uh, alloys in all positions, the advantages of our stick welding, shielded metal arc welding. Simplicity of the equipment, and it's fairly inexpensive. If you go to Walmart, you can get one for $100, $200. Uh, but the disadvantages is what I said was that operator factor, the low operator factor. Not as much welding time because you're having to change out electrodes all the time and then flip your helmet down and you know so you have the actual welding time that you actually have welded something and then the total time that it took you to do the job and if you're having to stop welding to replace an electrode obviously your operator factor is a little lower so so it uses a consumable rod electrode. Deposit slag on the weld bead to sum it all up, I should say. Here. <clears throat> Again, you'll have to chip that slag off. And then you can use a wire brush to clean it up, make it look nice. Provides shielding by the vaporization of the flux coating on the electrode. But you don't need to have a, a cylinder, a gas cylinder, to have to worry about. Uh, supplies constant welding current. Uh, weld appearance and quality are dependent upon operator skill and maintaining a constant arc length and travel speed. So, you know, you got to be pretty good at this. And then again, striking the arc. If you look at this, um, <clears throat> scratching it with AC, you come down, you know, it's curved like that. DC, it's better to poke. And you bring it up and you got to maintain a gap. You can't just hold it on there. It's just going to go... <clears throat> And I won't do anything because you have to maintain a gap, kind of like on a spark plug. 
All right, then different weaving patterns that you can have. Anyhow, welding speed faults. I think these, this is on the first quiz. Uh, welding current and rod speed normal. Width of weld and ripples on surface are uniform. You know, it looks nice. Penetration is fairly deep and well defined. So if you tested it, it wouldn't break at the weld. It may, the metal may break, but not at the weld. Arc has a sputtering hiss plus and irregular cracking sound. So again, like you're kind of frying bacon. Yeah, I guess more like bacon, you know, bacon and eggs, but it's, it's more bacon is what I was trying to say. So if you're actually frying bacon, it has that sound. <clears throat> now, if you have high current and the rod speed is normal, uh, the weld will be too broad because, you know, it's hotter, you know, if it's high current. And thin with a rough surface, considerable splatter, spatter, you see spatter or splatter, so you see all these little spots of weld. That shouldn't be there. Uh, mixed for a mess. Undercut. Crater is long and deep at the end. Arc has a regular explosive sound. You can, once when, when you've welded enough, you can tell by the sound if it's right or not. <clears throat> Low current and rod speed normal. Weld is too narrow, obviously, because it's not getting hot enough. And very high. It looks funny, you'll know. Rod burn, to me, this is the most obvious. Rod burns slowly. Penetration or yeah, you'll see. God, I'm getting a lot out of this rod. It's it's lasting a good long time. No, then there's something wrong. Penetration or fusion not very deep. So if if you test this, it's probably going to break at the weld. It's not a good thing. And a uh, few crackling sounds and irregular sputtering. Current speed normal and rod speed too slow. Well, then what do you think is going to happen? It's going to be too wide, right? So base metal and weld become heated over a considerable area, which results in crater burning through. And, you know, if it's a thin metal, too, you could burn holes through it. So you got to watch out for that. Current normal and the rod speed too fast. Well, then again, it's going to get too narrow, right? You're not depositing enough material if you're going too fast. All right, edges of bead are undercut. Size of bead depends upon ratio of rod speed and current setting. Normal arc sound, though because you have the current normal. All right, then welding terms here, convex, it's vexing out. Okay, like flexing out, you know, you flex your muscles, they come out. It's a convex, and then a concave, it's caving in. First, then you know you don't have enough material here, you may, you should have some of this, but not too much. And then your electrode identification, I think I have this on the first quiz. First two digits, like here, is the tensile strength times 1,000. So this would take, what, 60,000 PSI before it actually broke, which is strong. You'll see 60s and 70s and 80s. just depends on what you're doing. These are the common ones, 6011, 6010. 6011 works for AC. It's a good all-around uh, electrode. I find it easy to use. 6010 works better on DC. I mean, you can use them for both, but you'll notice it's much easier to weld with one or the other. I thought, oh, that's a bunch of malarkey. What, what is this all about? And then I tried it, and sure enough, yeah, it is easier if you're in D.C. to use a 6010. Because you may just have a pile of 6011s. I mean, it'll work, but it's just a little more difficult. Third digit identifies the position in which the electrode can be used. So here, if they have ones, that's good. You can use it in all positions, overhead. Uh, a pipe weld, a 45 degree pipe. Now you get to three, and game over, flat only. So this is interesting. One is good, uh, two horizontal and flat positions because these usually deposit a lot of extra material. You'll see our 70 24, 70 uh, 28s, and that high deposition um, electrodes, and so they're depositing, and they have more iron ore in them, so they're depositing more metal quicker. But because of that, it's going to sag on you on a vertical weld or uh, overhead. It's going to come out. And then, again, flat only. So you got to watch out for that. Uh, <clears throat> last dig digit signifies the usability of the electrode, amount of penetration, type of slag, presence of iron coating. Again, these contain iron powder, these 70, 14, 18, 24s. And you'll notice it's 4, 8, 4, 8 at the end. Extra iron powder. 
And then this tells you somebody was curious, well, what does all this mean? Well, here's all the different things you can add to it. And for what reason? So cellulose, you know, like wood fiber and sodium. Uh, DC, reverse polarity with the R there, deep penetration, flat or concave beads, fast fill, cellulose, potassium, AC, or DC, reverse dependent flat or concave, you know, so titanium, sodium, medium penetration, full freeze, I mean, and we'll get into fast freeze, all these different types of, but anyhow, iron, powder, low hydrogen, and that's good because you don't want much hydrogen. And we'll talk about some of these these low hydrogen electrodes that you keep warm in an oven to keep them dry. Because if you get moisture in there, that affects more water in there. That affects the quality of the weld, especially if you're doing welding nuclear reactors or something. You know, something where it has to be perfect. You don't want it leaking stuff that could hurt people. Here's our E for electrode. Is that a 6010? Okay, and that was good for what DC? There's a 6011 for AC. 6013. Those are good multi purpose too. And a 7018. Get into some low hydrogen. See how they're fatter? A little more material because it's depositing more. Anything with a 4A, it's got more iron oxide in it, deposits a lot of material. All right, so let's look at these electrodes real quick. Fast freeze, uh, 6010 DC or 6011, like I said, for AC welding. General fabrication of welding. Vertical up and overhead welding. Good pipe welding. Best choice on galvanized plate or pipe. Joints requiring deep penetration. All-purpose light slag, deep penetration, flat beads with distinct ripples. Gives you a nice pretty bead. Easy to chip off the slags. Nice. 7024 is a fast fill, high speed. Again, it's a two, so what's that? Flat and horizontal only. 70 psi and four means it's got a lot of that iron powder in it. Medium carbon crack sensitive steel only. Highest deposition rates of all electrodes. Good appearance and ripple free beads. Yeah, easy slag removal and medium penetration. So it depends on what you're looking for if you want deep penetration, medium penetration. High speed, downhill, downhill fillets and lap joint, uh, sheet metal fillets or laps. General purpose welding, all positions, medium deposition rates and medium penetration. All position, but mainly for flat and downhill. Easy to use, kind of nice. See how that versus, let's see. Here, 6011. Um, see how it's better for all these other types of welding. Best choice on galvanized plate or pipe. And it gets deeper penetration versus, versus the 13. They kind of look about the same, different colors sometimes. But medium penetration. All right, low hydrogen. This is the one that you usually uh, store, heat them up in a little oven for electrodes. Excellent physical and mechanical properties, all position operations, high deposition rates, distinct ripple with little spatter, fast fill, but all position. So again, that's good. See, there's our little one there. X-ray wells. Again, like I said, nuclear reactors and stuff like that. Doing a submarine, obviously, you want X-ray wells. Electrodes are stored in ovens to reduce moisture content. And then we'll have a quiz on that. I think that's enough for you to pass the quiz. Yeah, then we'll have another one later.